Hello, everyone. Joe Matz here with another edition of Espresso Jams. And today I am talking with Erin Edgar. She is a lawyer in Raleigh, North Carolina, and she owns her own firm. So her specialty is helping families protect for future generations. Hi, Erin. It's good to see you. Hi, Joe. It's very good to see you, too. So I'm very happy to, to be here. I'm happy to have you. We, we've known each other for a little while. We've, we've met on some of the networking groups that we're members of. Yes, indeed. Yeah, great. And you hail from Raleigh, North Carolina. Is that correct? Well, I wasn't born here, but I have lived in this area for about 28 years. And so I consider myself uh, a Raleigh Triangle area resident uh, forever. And I hope <laughs> that I never leave. It's a, it's a wonderful area, isn't it? Absolutely. You're listening to Espresso Jam. Short, concentrated, delicious conversations about business, technology, and entrepreneurship. If you're just starting out on your business adventure or you're a seasoned business professional, I'm sure you'll find value in these short conversations. Espresso Jams is brought to you by Apexable, providing the tools, insights, and transformative structures to help you reach your business summit. I'm your host, Joe Matz. Let's get started. And I see in your background, now if you're, if you're watching this, you can see this, um, and if you're listening, she has a clock tower in the background. Wh where is that picture from? Oh, it's really great. People think I've been to London. It's so fantastic. <laughs> but it's really not from London. I, uh, my alma mater was the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. I went there for undergrad and law school, and they have a huge bell tower. I miss that bell tower. It went off every 15 minutes. It was, it's an icon of the campus. Mm -hmm. And that is where that bell tower is from. So that's where you got your law degree. Yes. You must have moved here when you were like two years old. <laughs> Not quite. Um, I'm older than I look. I got my <laughs> law degree there in 2001. And I moved to North Carolina when I was 18 to attend UNC Chapel Hill. Ah, okay, great. And did you always want to be a lawyer? It's a very interesting question you ask because, no, I went through several career iterations when I was growing up, like I wanted to be a famous uh, singer and solo artist, you know, the Juilliard kind. Um, oh, then classic. I, yeah, yeah, yes. Uh, then I made a decision that, well, maybe I want to be a teacher. Then I went through a couple of other phases. And I finally settled on lawyer because of my affinity with the series, uh, the Star Trek universe, and that might sound like it doesn't relate, but it really does, because uh, in each of those episodes, you always had a situation, no matter what was going on, where one side wanted something and the other side wanted something else, and you never thought that they would agree. And at the very end, they found some sort of compromise or a way to collaborate or a way to work together. And I always thought that's what the law should be used for. It really isn't used for that, uh, but that's what our founders uh, of this great nation intended. That's how they intended for it to work. And so when I decided I wanted to become a lawyer, it was really a way for me to reconnect with the roots of our nation and support the Constitution and the government that our founders intended. Uh, in our own modern world. So philosophically, those are my reasons for getting into law in the first place. And if we want, you know, the type of law, that's a whole other story. That's another story. We'll get into that. <laughs> but that, see, I'm kind of a closet Trekkie myself. Mm. A lot, most people don't know that. So yeah, I've got friends and we, we message back and forth about Star Trek things. Mm -hmm. um, so interesting. I've never, never really, um, been introduced to that perspective, but yes, they're always finding finding a compromise and, and a way to satisfy both sides. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's great. And, and I love the fact that you're not out there litigating. I mean, litigation is not your objective, is it? 
No, and I actually want to keep people out of court. So what I part of what I do is to help people plan so they never have to go to court, so their family never has to go to court. Because I work with with families and and uh, and and people who want to plan for their for the, their future. It's called estate planning. Okay. Um, so and and that's what I do now. I didn't always do that, but my main objective is is never to have to go to court. <laughs> Okay, so so you didn't always do that. What did you start out doing? So I started out doing, um, I, I knew when I first started law school, I wanted to be a lawyer, but I didn't know the type of law that I wanted to uh, do. And I thought it was international law and, and diplomacy and helping nations work together. I thought that's what, mm-hmm. where my interest was. And very quickly, I realized that I was more interested in helping the local people, you know, the people I live and work with every day. And so to that end, when I got out of law school, I started work in conflict resolution and I did some mediation with the Wake County court system here in in Wake County um, and moved into working for uh, to to prevent conflict uh, and disagreement. So their cases didn't have to go to court and also preventing people from being convicted of small misdemeanor crimes. And mediation is actually very good for that. It's more about uh, helping your neighbors and friends get along because you did something dumb because you didn't like them. You know, you destroyed their property or you (laughs) ran over their pet turtle and they brought you to court. That actually, it it was a thing. Um, And yes. And so uh, I did that for a while. And then I moved into working in the nonprofit sector and assisting people to obtain people in poverty to obtain things that they were entitled to, like their unemployment benefits or Mm -hmm. their disability benefits or helping them figure out what to do if they're evicted from their home because they didn't pay rent uh, and, and what was all going on with that. Um, I did that for 11 years, again, uh, supporting the people in my community and keeping them out of court and out of, you know, hearings and out of the bureaucratic machine as much as possible and helping them work out a solution. Uh, And then in 2017, I knew I wanted to start my own firm. I just had this entrepreneurial spirit and I didn't want to do what I was doing forever. I knew that there had to be an end point because it wasn't really where I belonged. I was interested in working with families with children in some way. Uh, I have a deep interest in assisting uh, families who have children with a special need or disability. As I was a disabled child myself, I lived in the system. I happened to be blind. Uh, So I did a little bit of work in special education law, one or two matters. Um, I did a little bit of family law work, which is divorce and custody issues. I knew I didn't belong there, but I wanted to work with families. And so in uh, I was trying to figure out where I what I was going to do. And in 2019, I had a situation in my own family uh, with a family death and the person involved had an estate plan, basically a a will and a trust Mm -hmm. and powers of attorney to to support her and her family that were 20 years out of date. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. It was horrible. And Mm -hmm. she lived in another state. And my uncle and father were running around while she was alive, trying to get her to sign things to to allow them to, to take care of her. Because the people that she had assigned to do that 20 years ago were all deceased. Um, And so they got that done. However, they didn't update her will and her trust with her current intentions. And so when she died, what was governing the distribution of her property, I'll get out of the legalese in a second, but what was governing everything were those old wills and trusts that she had with her husband And we knew that she had different intentions, but we couldn't prove it. And nobody wanted to go to court. It would just, it was bleed the estate dry. And it would bleed them dry too, if they took it to court. And so they they made a kind of compromise that really didn't make anyone happy, but it was the best solution. Um, And so my father had kept contacting me like, what do I do? What do I say to these people? Because I I don't have a lawyer. Like I'm like I can't be your lawyer. 
<laughs> I'm not licensed in that state, but I can help you figure out what to do. And I realized, you know, I was really kind of good at this, you know, guiding people into um, and, and counseling people, number one. And number two, I made a commitment to myself that I would not let any of this happen to anyone in my local community if I could help it. Mm -hmm. And so why I'm here today and what really got me started in my own business was this commitment that I made to help people uh, draft estate plans that were appropriate to the place that they were now and yet flexible enough to adapt to many of the life transitions that they had and make the process not about the documents, because many attorneys, it's very transactional. We'll, we'll draft your will for you, we'll get it done. And they do, and there's nothing wrong with that. But I am, I could do, go a little further and want to maintain a relationship with my client so that when their life changes, their plans can change. And an estate plan is no different. It's a plan right. to help them change that plan to adapt to their new life so that people have their back, they're protecting their kids, um, and and everyone is provided for in the way that they want. It sounds like what you're doing now, there, there were roots before with the working with the county, working with individuals helping people get what they deserve from what the government offers and many people yes. don't take advantage of and yes. it's, it sounds to me like an evolution that brought you to where you are today it did and it was an evolution that first started with you know helping people take advantage of what number one, what the government offers, and number two, what agreements they can come to themselves through, uh, you know, someone guiding them to collaborate with each other. Um, and now it has moved into a way to uh, counsel people on what they really want and to put that into a legal framework as far as is possible, because actually what the government offers you on your death is pretty terrible. <laughs> it's like, I mean, you always have an estate plan, but the government's plan uh, is not meant to be your own. It's meant to be the government's plan. And so number one, it has nothing in place to help protect you while you're alive and to ensure that trusted people are making your health care and financial decisions if you cannot. Um, and what is in place upon your death is really, uh, it's like from the 1200s. I mean, it's very medieval. Uh, and spouses are not well protected. So if you want everything to go to your spouse, you may be out of luck because it might not happen. Uh, and what really happens is that things go to the people that are related to you by bloodline. Right. Yeah. And it's it's really a shame. Every once in a while, you, you hear about you know, famous people, but we probably all know people who have passed away, intelligent people mm -hmm. who passed away, but they left a mess mm -hmm. for, for the folks who remained here. And it's just such a shame. It seems like something that's relatively simple to avoid. It is simple to avoid, and it also saves you money. Uh, people don't think that because it's it's counterintuitive. Like, right, you you go to an attorney and you you say, well, I don't want to spend the money to do this. I my affairs are really simple. Uh, they may not stay simple, and you may die with a lot of complexity that you're not aware of, and you may be in the hospital, and other people are making healthcare decisions that you wouldn't want and costing you more in medical bills than you would prefer. I'm thinking about people who. You know, they get put on uh, life prolonging measures when they don't want them or they're right. given medications when they're sick that they do not want and it costs money. Um, and so when you plan effectively, you spend money up front taking care of things on the front end that your family will have to take care of on the back end. And I, I got that from a person who worked in HR. And I keep using that phrase because it, it really succinctly sums it up to a point. And even beyond that, you're saving your family and those people who care about you a lot of emotional grief and heartache. Yes. And that's really the most important thing. You know, I said saving money, and that's important because you're saving court fees. Uh, you're saving 
a court proceeding to have someone claimed your guardian if you're alive and can't decide for yourself because that's what happens and it takes over a month and it costs thousands of dollars potentially. Um, you're saving um, medical expenses, which are again, tens of thousands, might be tens of thousands. And you're saving after your death court costs which rise if your estate is kept open a long time because the court requires it's due and you have to pay fees for that. Uh, What's and the fees of so, the court, the lawyers? I mean, we've all heard of celebrities yeah. that spent millions there, of dollars. And you got to pay the lawyers too after yeah. your death if you leave a mess. And it no can one be expects years. you to do it yourself. And it, it and, can be years. Yeah, crazy. It's crazy. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, I've known, I've known some people also who, who would not be you would not consider them like the intelligent people, you know, the upper levels of, of mental um, abilities, but they left things very simple. Mm-hmm. They left things, they had property, but, you know, they had property, they had bank accounts, they had investments, but they left it very simple for their children. Yeah. And, and then you have these people that are considered extremely intelligent, very smart, multimillionaires, and they leave a mess. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's there's something there that there I don't is. understand. And there's also a misperception that estate planning is only for rich people. Mm. Um, you know, I get clients all the time. Well, I don't know if I need one because, you know, my again, I'll go back to my affairs are simple. You know, I don't have much. And I will always tell people it's not just about what you have. It's about, number one, what you will have. And it's about you personally, too. It's not just about your money or your property or whatever it is. It's not just about that. Um, it's about having people you trust make your decisions, both during your life and after your death. Because if you don't leave that in place, as I said, the court may have to appoint guardians for you, and they may not be people you want. Honestly, right. the judge doesn't know. I mean, the clerk doesn't know you in North Carolina. Um, they don't know you. Uh, they just go by what they think is your best interest. And as I said, it takes weeks and weeks. Uh, there have to be hearings and all this stuff. Would you like to get in front of more of your ideal clients and at the same time build your brand and create evergreen content? Well, you can do that with podcast guesting. This very moment, you're listening to a podcast that may have been published today or three weeks ago or three years ago. In a very real sense, you're engaging with the speakers, hopefully enjoying yourself and learning something new at the same time. And you're getting to know the guests and how they help their clients, their customers, and the problems that they solve. You may even be their ideal client and want to learn more about them and download one of their free resources you can find in the show notes or maybe even become a client of theirs. See, when you're a guest on a podcast, you will enjoy that same kind of engagement. It is perhaps the easiest, most cost-effective way to get in front of new audiences. Learn how you can be a guest on the right podcast and engage with your ideal clients with the free resources available at gapologist.com. And number two, going back to trusted individuals on your death, it's not necessarily um, set in stone that the clerk of uh, court in North Carolina is going to appoint who you want uh, to, to take care of everything for you. They're going to appoint the person who acts like they know the most about you. It may not be the person you want. Right. And now, how do you address someone who wants to have an estate plan, but they also are in phases of transition in their life? And they've, mm-hmm. they've had good times. They've had bad times. They might be in a good time now. A bad time might be coming up or they might be in a bad time now, but things are going to go well for them in, in a, because that's the way their life has been. And they're, they want to have an estate plan, but they don't want anything set in stone. They want to be flexible because their life is is fluctuating. How do you address something like that? This is something that I have gotten asked a lot. And actually what what I have what has happened primarily is that I'll have people say, well, I really want to do this, but I have a lot going on right now. Um, and when we start talking about it, we find out that what they really mean is that they are, they have just completed a transitional phase. They've just gotten married and they're moving in 
a house or they've just bought a house and they're working on getting everything set up. It's often when the transition has either started, just started or just completed. And so I will tell people if the transaction has just completed, this is the perfect time to make an estate plan. Perfect, because you've just transitioned into a new phase of your life, and this is where we can address that transition and incorporate it into your plan. For instance, if you just get married, then you and your husband can make a plan together, and there is nothing that is more satisfying than serving a newly married couple. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't matter what what age they are. It, it is so satisfying. Um, the, the only thing I can think of that is more satisfying to me personally is serving a family uh, who has children. But um, that aside, the, the transitions when they're finished are really the ideal places. The transitions that are just starting are a little, a little rockier, and it depends on the length of the transition. Um, and what I tell people is, if you, if you are going through, you know, a phase and it's going to last a year or so thinking of divorces uh, it might be good to to postpone this but we can get started on it because a lot of times divorcing spouses really don't want their separated spouse to make their medical decisions or their financial right. decisions if they can't so we can start on putting that in place who they do want mm. uh, and then when they get divorced we can do the rest um because there are some things that go down if you're still married to someone, if you actually die, that you might not want, but we really can't push them aside. Um, they have to happen and your, your spouse has to be involved. And I have served a couple of divorcing people, but again, the circumstances have to be really special. And it's part of my job to help you identify where you are in your transition, number one, and how we can work together to ease that transition if that's possible, number two, uh, and if it's best to wait it out, number three. Mm -hmm. Almost always there's something that we can do to ease the transition, even if we can't do, you know, the full 360. Okay, so there's, there's some place to some place. There's to some start. place to start. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now I have another question. Um, we're getting into some details here, but this is this is such a great conversation, Aaron. Um, what about situations where we've all heard of where someone had a will and testament, but they were maybe they weren't of sound mind anymore, and, mm -hmm. um, and someone went in there and had this person sign a document that changed the previous document when they were of sound mind, and all of a sudden. You know, out of the seven children, it's all the money is going to one and the one person is making all the financial decisions. And now they're the executor of the state because they found mm -hmm. their parent in in a situation where they just said, sign this. This is an important document. You need to sign it. And the parent was not of sound mind anymore, maybe on drugs, maybe very sick, maybe on their deathbed. What happens in, in a situation like that? Well, I will preface this by saying what I might have needed to say before at the beginning, which is that I cannot give legal advice to specific situations. So this is sort of a disclaimer. Um, if this is a disclaimer for, you know, the whole podcast is, is simply a general information and, and not specific legal advice. However, I will say that in general terms, really, if nobody does anything or says anything, Nothing will happen. However, if other people who were involved, let's say there were other heirs or other children, you said seven children, I think. I don't know. Yeah. But uh, seven children, if one of them speaks up and says, this isn't right, and you know, perhaps they go to the hospital and say something, if the parent's in the hospital, the hospital... Um, you know, looks into it, maybe gets, there is a, a resource called Adult Protective Services, which is a Department of Social Services, gets them involved. They may do their own little investigation, but eventually these kinds of things may 
uh, you know, lawyers get involved, who knows, they may go to court. And then, you know, the, the court system will take over and find out whether this person who's taking care of the parent is really the right person and whether there was some sort of we call it undue influence mm. uh, in general or duress, which is another term. They're kind of similar, but not. Um, and so, you know, whether there was any of that going on and they have to, you know, that's where a court may get involved and make a decision. It doesn't always happen. Maybe something gets worked out, but right. basically nothing's going to happen unless someone speaks up. <laughs> you know right uh, someone has to then disagree with with that document that that mm -hmm. was written up and and maybe try to get back to the previous document well um, if there was a previous one if there was and it, it can get very messy it yeah. can get messy because a lot of times when you have new documents that are issued they say we revoke all previous documents right if that's in there then the court has to get involved really most of the time to determine what's best right based and, on and the I, situation i think the term the duress and undue or undue In, influence? influence there are, there are several different terms and really okay. what it means is someone's getting somebody to do something that might not be in their best interest and if if we're talking about duress basically there's some sort of force involved it, okay. Not physical force, but some kind of force. Like if you don't do this, uh, this bad thing will happen to you. Um, and if we're talking about undue influence, it's just a situation. It's a situation where someone is controlling a person's life to such an extent that person feels as if they must make the decisions that this other person is encouraging them to make. Right. Right. And it's it's just. Oh, I feel like we, we got into some darker areas did. Of, of the law. So let's bring it back. And, and really mm -hmm. what, what you do is you help people to avoid these situations and families to avoid these situations. Yes. And part of the estate planning process, one of the reasons that I really recommend it is that it's very proactive. It gets mm -hmm. people started on thinking about what they how they want their future to unfold and to help them avoid all of these really dark, as you said, situations that can come up. Another one that I think of just to use as an example, you're an 85 year old woman or man, and you are in very good health for being 85, but maybe six or seven years down the road, you might hit some really bad spots and you may need to be in a nursing home how can you plan for that so the government doesn't eat up all of your assets paying for your medical care? Um, it's a process called estate recovery. Uh, and basically, they'll put you in a nursing home, but then at the end of your life, they'll come back and ask for all your medical bills that they paid. Uh, how can you avoid that? Um, and there are ways to plan for a time in your life when you're going to have less than optimal physical health unless... And, and you're going to have to be in that nursing home. So proactive planning is, is really important. When you're a young family, there are ways to proactively plan so that if you cannot be found somehow, like you get in a car accident or you don't come home from date night, your children are cared for by people you would want. Because let's just say the babysitter's caring for your kids. You don't come home from date night. You're alive. You're in the hospital or something. I don't know. But what happens is the police eventually show up because, you know, people aren't just going to leave kids unattended. And if you're not home, the police and social services come and the children are placed in, in general, what happens is the children are placed in some sort of protective custody situation until somebody can be found to care for them. And people don't want that. Um, right. And so you can name and have in place of prominence, you know, in your home, people you want to care for your children. And instead of calling the police, the babysitter calls your neighbor down the street because you've designated them as somebody that they can call who is trusted to care for your children in a temporary situation. Right. So that is another example of proactive planning. I think there's a lot of um, the proactive planning and there's a lot of 
thought and a lot of a lot of things. Let me just use that word in general. A lot of things that people who are not involved with this on a daily basis as you are, not as deep as you are, we just don't think about. Mm -hmm. And And there's, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, as I, I was talking to someone, you know, before, and she said, I never thought about that. Like, and she said, maybe I should have. And I said, oh no, this is what I think about all day. This is my job. This is not your job. My job is to be your expert that you consult your counselor well, maybe not for everybody, but but I was telling her, your uh, legal counselor, I should specify, and think of those, you know, sort of like darker situations that you wouldn't think of and, and you know, help you plan for them. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Because you're involved with it day to day. You know it. You're, you, you've had examples. You've, mm-hmm. you've seen things. You know things. And, and we just don't think about that every day. I don't want to think about that stuff every day. <laughs> I don't blame you. (laughs) Aaron, this has been a wonderful conversation. Absolutely. I completely agree. Do you have for our listeners today, do you have any, any gifts or any, anything you'd like to leave them with today? Sure. So I would like to offer to anyone who is listening a free 30 minute complimentary protect you and yours consultation. And in this consultation, we will get to know each other and talk about any current or lack thereof estate planning that you have done personally and decide whether or not it is uh, it is accurate for you as, as your life is now and whether you need to make any changes. Um, this is simply a, a free way for those of us who are in the local area to come together and get to know one another and see if we are a good fit to work together. Okay. That sounds great. Very generous of you. How can someone get in touch with you and learn more about you or schedule this conversation? There are, uh, there is a link in the show notes and that link will take you to ways that you can get in touch with me personally and learn about me and also book that consultation. Okay, very good. And folks, that will be in the show notes. So check that out. Aaron, it has been a pleasure once again. And um, it's just great to talk with you. I really like your your attitude and, and where you come from and how you, you bring forth your caring for people. Thank you. And I think you said it at the um, end just perfectly, caring for people. It is all about service. Yes. And when we come from a place of service, People know that, understand that, feel that, and it translates into uh, abundance for everyone. So Absolutely. thank you for having me on your show. That is a great way to end the show today. Thank you so much. Goodbye, everyone. See you next time. Thank you for listening to Espresso Jams. If you like what you heard, please subscribe on your preferred channel. Never miss another episode. If you'd like more business tips on technology, entrepreneurship, and doing better, you can find me on LinkedIn at Joe Matz, that's J-O-E-M-A-T-Z, or go to my website, apexable.com, that's apex-able.com. I'm your host, Joe Matz, wishing you an awesome day.